So this was one of those mornings. So then as soon as I did that, put them in your pocket, Eric, so you can get to church. So then I get in the car and realize I didn't have my keys. Oh, where? Oh, they're in my pocket. It reminded me of uh, this week as I was teaching one day. I, I head over to the piano. I'm a choir teacher. And so I head over to the piano and I go to plunk a couple notes for them. And I don't know what happened to me, but I, I, I'm just like that. And it sounded so good to me, so I sat down. Meanwhile, I have 30 sittings, students sitting there wondering what I'm doing, right? Uh, because we were going to be rehearsing, but my brain just went <laughs> off somewhere like a balloon that forgot to get tied because we all know the balloon is the one that's supposed to tie itself. So I come to you in a very fuzzy mental state that's lasted a whole week from a lot of busyness and yet with a heart full of God's goodness and uh, a, a trust that God is going to be speaking to us today. Uh, if we're listening, I'm a very firm believer. I've sat under several messages. They're 53 years old. My dad was a pastor when I was younger, and so we did not miss it. We were that family that when we went on vacation, we would find a local church to attend. That was our family. And then my dad would say, go meet them, go meet them. And I'm like, it's not even my church. Why do I have to greet people? Um, that was our family. So I've heard a lot of messages. And what I became absolutely convinced of was it's not the pastor's job to teach me. Christ is already there present to teach me, and if I am listening, I will hear something from God himself. It is definitely helpful when the pastor is doing a good job preaching. Um, <laughs> so hopefully today I'm not so distracted uh, that I distract you from being able to listen. Um, let's pray, as a matter of fact, just that our ears could be open, that our hearts could be open. God, you hear us even now, and you know that uh, we came, where we're online streaming, where we're watching this three weeks from now on YouTube, because we want to hear you, we want to learn from you, we want to grow. We want your love to be so active in our lives, and your light so is shooting from our attitudes and what we do, uh, that people can know you. So today, Help us hear, absorb it, let it be planted on great prepared soil uh, so that it bears fruit. Amen. The passage, Isaiah 55, starts off with if uh, anyone is thirsty. Uh, one translation says, hey you, uh, if anyone's thirsty, uh, most trans translations say, ho, right? It's like, ha, huh, right? It's like a attention getter, right? And I thought, you know, I'm not always, if I'm being honest, a lot of times I'm not always thirsty. It made me think of a time that I was on the Pacific Crest Trail, and I was doing an 11-day trek, and I had all my food in my backpack, and I had my water bladder thing that you have with this hose that came out, right? And I was a smart hiker at that time, so if there was a stream, even if I had just filled up, I refill it. And if there's a lake, I do my purification process so that my water bladder is completely not my bladder, the backpack water bladder. It's what they call them. I'm sorry. Okay, some of you are nodding and some of you are like, why are you using that word still? It's because it's what they're called. Um, my camelback, thank you. Thank you very much. My camelback, uh, my off-brand camelback that was less expensive. Um, <laughs> that they called a bladder. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> I told you, I'm fuzzy today. Don't joke with me. Uh, no, go ahead. But anyway, it was consistently filled. So I'm going day after day after day, and I'm not thirsty. i got to be honest, I'm not thirsty. I'm enjoying my hike most of it once the food got eaten down and my pack was lighter. I'm having a nice time. I had enough food. I had enough water. Why would I even worry about a passage like this that talks about those who are thirsty, right? Right? wouldn't worry about it. And sometimes in our spiritual life, don't we find ourselves there? We're well stocked. My finances are going good. My job is going good. My health is, I'm getting older, but hey, for my age, my health is going good. Things are good. God's blessing me. I'm not thirsty. And then I thought of another time when I had well prepared for a marathon. 
Uh, and I was, I was ready for 26.2 miles. And I knew that they had stations of water along the way. So I didn't worry about bringing my camel back. I didn't worry about it, right? I, I was prepared. What I was not prepared for was it was in the fall, around this October time. And you know how sometimes September, end of September, early October, the weather cools down, and then boom, there's a hot day. Right? Yes, right? So I'm going along, and I'm, rem- I'm just taking a little sip, because that's all I need, because I, I wasn't even dripping that much, mostly because I wasn't running that fast, but thank you. I don't know who that was laughing, but thank you. So I'm going along, and I, all of a sudden, I'm at mile 14, and I just stop. <sighs> Famished. Absolutely parched. I had forgotten you have to have some of the Gatorade, too, not just the water. You have to, right? And you have to stop at every stop if you're counting on their little Dixie cups. And I was parched. All of a sudden, I'm thirsty. I think in this passage, I bring those two stories out because when we read this passage, oh, everyone, by the way, this was, I found this online. Pastor Merrill uh, led me to it, and it's the Hebrew, like literally the Hebrew script, the, the scribble and scrawl, with the pronunciation of the Hebrew above it with the English below it. And I was reading this, and I know you, I know you can't see it, so I'll read it for you, but it says, and eat, buy, come, money, have you who know, and to the waters come, who thirst everyone ho. And then I remembered, oh, they read it backwards. They start on the other side. Ho, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And at that point, when those two stories were colliding in me, I remembered everyone thirst. When I read it out of context, who thirst? Everyone. Oh, that's not the way the Hebrews read it. But it took me reading it the wrong way to realize, Eric, just because you're thirst, not thirsty now because you've taken care of you, you will be thirsty and you better be prepared. And the only way to prepare for that time that you will be thirsty is to make sure that you keep yourself hydrated. Don't become thirsty. And the spiritual application of that, of that is huge for us, yes or no? So if you're looking at your sheet there, you notice there's a question. You're noticing that there's a question. Who is thirsty and hungry? You could write down a couple answers. You could say, I am. You could say, everyone. You could say, the person next to me. Because everyone is, or will be, or has been, and will be again thirsty. The next question that came up, though, as I'm reading this is, and you who have no money... Buy and eat. Come, buy and eat, you who have no money. And that begged me the question, you can see it there, does it cost or not? Yeah, you're saying I don't have money, I'm penniless, right? Title of the message, penniless. I'm penniless, and yet it's telling me to buy. It's telling me, come, buy. Is there a cost? I want to suggest that yes, there is a cost. You have to buy this water and this food. There is a cost. It's just not money. We're going to look at that. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? Some of you have the Bible open right there. You're looking at verse 2. That's awesome. You're not going to be able to read it on the screen today. So you might as well have it open or just let my voice bring it to you. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. I think we're hearing about the cost right now. I think as we get there, we're starting to hear about the cost a bit. Incline your ear to me and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. What are you chasing? What are you chasing? A dog in the desert's going to chase water anywhere they can get it. Anywhere they can get it, right? We're going to be buying things. Anytime you think you need something, we're going to be buying it, right? Oh, I think I need, we're going to hunt for it. Hopefully not on credit. But God says this thing that will satisfy, this thing that will satisfy doesn't take money. What does it take? Listen. Incline your ear. Did you hear it? 
when you read that and it says, come and buy without, why do you spend your money on that? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Why do you chase the things that don't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat. In other words, this thing that we get a feast upon is God speaking himself. We get to feast upon at no cost except our ear being bent. I will share with you in the Greek version of the Hebrew, so now I'm going into English to explain to you what I read from the Greek Bible that was translating the Hebrew Bible. We'll take it for what it is. But that word, uh, listen, incline your ear, has a very strong implication that you are not just hearing, but that you are listening with the intent to obey that you are listening with the intent that you will follow through if God does so speak. Otherwise, you're not really listening. You're just hearing. You're that kid that hears what the mom and dad says and says, yeah, but, right? That hears it. So what are you chasing to satisfy? That's a beautiful question. Is it bread? Is it food? Is it things? Is it recognition? Is it recognition? Is it power? Is it pleasure? What are you chasing? It's not going to satisfy. How do we know that? Because we keep coming back to it. What does satisfy? God's word. And how do we purchase it? By being willing to listen. Step one is the listening to the buying. Step two, step two is the abundance, the delighting abundance. Did you hear that at the end of it? Of verse two, it says, listen carefully, eat what's good, and delight in abundance. Now it's not talking about the material things I don't think. I don't think it's coming to the point where it's saying delight yourself in the abundance of of the other stuff. Our ear is inclined and we're coming in and delighting in the plethora of God's ability to speak into our situation. So today, today, Thursday, I'm going back. I'm sitting at the piano and as I'm sitting there and I'm just in my spot, there's a melody. At first the kids are wondering what is he doing? We're supposed to be rehearsing. And then they just relax. They just enjoy. Oh, I don't have any homework right now. Oh, I don't have to think right now. And when I finish, you can see their faces. You can see that something about me living into the moment and living out of what was speaking to my soul at that time actually fed in abundance. It flowed out from me into the lives of those around me. And that's a really almost stupid illustration where some people could say I was wasting time but for the kids the beauty of that song ministered to where their hearts were at in the middle of their busy difficult middle school is difficult life right an abundance came out of me being willing to listen and obey and I delighted instead of chastising myself for wasting four minutes and being so distractible that these 30 kids didn't get their choir education Instead, I rejoiced in the fact that what came out of me was able to be a blessing to somebody else. How many of you are blessed already? Your hearts hearts are hearing some of this message about where we're at. So back to the trail. Back to the trail. Mm. The step, delight, abundance, yeah. Okay, I'm in the right spot. I'm in the present. I'm in the present. If you're following the notes, I've just uh, moved past the penniless, realizing that we're not penniless. We have ears, and that's the price that we get to pay is just listening and obeying. And I'm on to the present. I'm on to the present. So now I'm on the Pacific Crest Trail. This was about day three, and I had ascended a lot of spaces, and all of a sudden there was snow. I'm like, oh, this is gorgeous. And I'm walking through the snow, and all of a sudden I realize the snow is covering the trail. I'm not a good map reader, and I don't know where the next trail is. And, okay, i got to find this trail Uh, because I know it's going to descend soon, but I don't, uh, okay, I see Three Finger Jack. You guys know Three Finger Jack down by Big Lake off of the, oh, such a beautiful thing. I had just rounded that, came up off the lake that's down behind Three Finger Jack and was heading up uh, off off the other side towards a lolly lake and stuff in the snow. The map doesn't make sense. All I got is Three Finger Jack. If you know anything about triangulation, you know you need three points. I only knew about by lane, by, you know, the, uh, not triangulation, three points. I knew two points, the trail behind me, the trail ahead of me, right? So I was a little bit, 
I finally figured it out though. If I'm gonna find my way, I need to know where I am and I need to be able to at least get back to where I am. So I don't remember if I like posted a stick in the ground or something and I started just going a little bit off and a little, the trail wasn't that far. It wasn't that far ahead, but the not knowing where I was made me kind of panicked, made me kind of panicked. Sometimes we read this passage, you there, ho there, thirst, come, incline your ear, listen, and then we get to this point of seek the Lord while he may be found, and we're like, oh yeah, I need you, God, now. I, I think there's a different message in this, that it is not when I am desperate and hungry and thirsty, because we just covered, you will always become hungry and thirsty, so be prepared, right? Drink up, keep eating, don't stop eating. I think when it comes to this passage, this part that it says, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near, is a lot less than me being lost on the trail. Let's just look at the questions in there and see if the scriptures pop out, right? When is the best time to seek the Lord according to the passage? While he may be found. When is the best time? While he may, when is the best time to seek the Lord? While he may be found. I gave you the answer before I asked the question. I'll try again. So seek him while he may be found. When is the best time to seek the Lord? That was better. You're about as slow as my middle schoolers were this week. That's okay. We still love you. Wait a minute. When can the Lord be found? Anytime. Anytime. Seek the Lord while he may be found. When am I to seek him? When he can be found. When can he be found? Any time. Right now. In this present moment. In this present moment. Well, have you heard this passage kind of poo-poo us about thinking about the past or worrying about the future? Has anybody done that to you in this passage? Me too, right? Me too. And I think it's slightly appropriate, except... As humans, the way God created us, we can remember the past. And we do think about the future, true or present, right? True or false, true or... Can I just go play the piano a bit? (laughs) Right? Yeah, yes, yes. Just stop talking, Eric. Your music is beautiful. Um, (laughs) But in that idea of my brain will gravitate out of this present moment. We, we are dr- drug into the past. And sometimes our brain is pushed into the future. But I cannot find God in a m- manner that will quench my thirst or feed my soul in the past. I cannot find God in the future with my imagination, right? So what is the past and the future for? I was thinking of the Israelites because he actually tells them to remember, correct? Correct. He tells them to remember, but what is he telling them to remember? He is not telling them to remember all those times that somebody belittled you or all of your wounds and all of the bad things that happened in your childhood. No. He says, remember how I pulled you out. Write my laws on your skirt and look at them every day. These are way back from the time of Moses. Remember my rules, my laws, so that the way you live in the present Okay, So when your history comes up about those horrible things that happened or that person that did this, or instead of just remembering the situation, maybe we get to remember how in that present moment God showed up. God showed up. And as I'm starting to think about the future, it is not the worry and the what ifs, but it is realizing in my present moment and in every moment in my life, God has brought me back around and he is available for me to seek right now. So I know in three weeks when I have a performance with my middle schoolers on a stage that they're writing themselves and the writing might be that God's going to be with me through that and they're going to have a good experience and God's going to lead and occasionally I'll sit at the piano and somebody will hear me play and I don't have to worry about the future. I can focus on my right now. It's almost like I'm pre-practicing. If I were to answer that question, what is our imagination and planning for the future useful for then? Pre-practicing. In my mind, when I think of the future, I now practice in my brain watching God use me. 
Does that make sense? I now watch myself when I think of my future, not how am I going to deal with that rascal coming in? How am I going to deal with it when I displease my wife again? Instead, I'm thinking, oh, God's used me in the past. He is going to use me in the future. I can picture myself being calm and patient. I can imagine myself, right, using my ability to think of the future in a manner that sets me up to claim and seek the ever-present Christ in that moment that will become. I, I don't know if I'm making sense with that. Um, it feels like a trip, but pre-practicing, I think that's what it's for. I want to come up with a different idea, if that's okay, for this uh, seek while he may be found as well, of us seeking the Lord. Uh, you, you've heard of the Wizard of Oz in the Emerald City, right? And there was a moment in, in that when uh, the one behind the curtain reclaimed what he had been. He got all the power. He was trying everything else and stuff like that. And then he was discovered, and he stepped out from the curtain, and he's like, hey, from my history, there's this balloon. It got me here. I want to stay here. But hey, or actually, did he go? I forget. But he had that moment of realization of a return. Uh, something sought him out, if I might. I was in Macy's with my mom, and I was probably six years old. I was an active kid. I don't know, did any parents here with active kids everywhere? Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> even if they're gro Oh, I have a kid in the back saying, he's the active one. Is that right? Oh, you're the active one. Okay, I thought you were, <laughs> I thought you were saying, he always gets lost. Well, we're in Macy's. And my mom is putting a dress on order and stuff at the counter and just going through the business and turns around and I'm gone. I'm gone. I do. Usually it was I would hide in the middle of the clothing racks with her right there. She'd go to the next rack and I'd go to the next rack with her and climb through them. It was great hiding places and just lots of giggles and fun. Now I'm gone. So she hunted in the nearest clothing racks, wasn't there. So she went back to the clerk and said, I can't find my son and they're hunting everywhere for me. Well, one of the clerks um, located in the front of the store, back in the old days, you know how they used to do the paint can displays, right? The pyramids of paint can displays, right? Where it's like the whole base is 15 cans and then you go to 14 and there, and up at the top of the paint can display was Eric, me. And the workers there going, um, uh, and my mom's like, come on down, honey. Come on down. The next question on your sheet, are we the only or even the first doing the seeking according to Scripture? Are we the only or the first to do the seeking? No. God seeks first. He created us. Think to the garden even. As soon as we turned our back on the promise and the opportunity and clothed ourselves up and went hiding in case, God came, called their names, hunted for them to be with them. God seeks. Think of Jesus' story about the, the sheep in the pen, right? One was gone. Did he expect the sheep to seek him out? No. The good shepherd leaves the 99 to go hunt. And at this point, I want to say and suggest that God has been seeking you every single day and continues. Oh, I'm already a Christian, Eric, and God seeks you, seeks you out every single day. Oh, I've been following him for 25 years, Eric, and God is still seeking time with you, seeking to whisper into your heart the things that will make a difference. He's hunting for you, created us. We walked away. And since the garden, God keeps seeking, calling. Scripture says he seeks worshipers. Yes? Since he seeks worshipers. Uh, now, I have some friends who, uh, they turn that into a really selfish thing. Oh, you want to worship a God who, like, actually asks you to worship him? And I'm like, okay, you're not thinking. You're not thinking. What does worship mean? Well, it doesn't mean like singing and thinking that they're better than you. And no, all worship means is to bend your attention to something. That's all it means. The wheat, uh, there's an Old Testament passage where it talks about the wheat worshiping in the wind. Now, the translators don't translate it worship. They just translate it bending. But that's what the worship means, is it bends to the wind. And so when we're worshiping God, all we're doing is 
Yeah, you're bowing. No, 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 no. You, you don't get it. What is God? God's a creator. What is, has God got good intentions for me or bad? And he's got good intentions. Why would I not want to bend my attention and my will and my, it, to something that wants to benefit me, to someone who loves me? Why would I not do that? Right? That is a very intelligent thing to do, to bend your will and your attention to one who has your best interest. Right? Anyway. God seeks worshipers. He wants worshipers. Okay, I'm, I'm down. I'm almost about to the point of the powerful, if that's okay. We're going to finish up that last little bit of being present, and then I'm going to move on to the powerful. Have you ever been in a situation where the product that you created that you've been working on you were displeased with? Maybe you're working on somebody's filling in their mouth, right? And all of a sudden you realize, oh, crumb. You know, that. oh, I botched that one. That's going to scratch them all day long. Okay, i got to file that back down. Well, I've had choir performances where I put my choirs up in front of an audience and they start singing and, ooh, okay. I try and tuck out so nobody says anything to me before. You know, afterwards, parents are usually, oh, thank you, thank you. After some of those concerts, I'm like, I hope nobody talks to me. I'm just, oh, I'm not too happy. Disappointment. Well, I solved that problem. I solved that problem. I stopped expecting great things at my concerts. And instead, I started thinking, oh, I'm an educator. This is about, this choir, middle school is about us learning, Right? So I was more focused on what do we get to do each day as we're making music? What do I get to do in the moment with the kids? We have had some amazing musical moments in the classroom where they hear the chord ring and the room vibrates with the chord or they did this expressive element and they're like, you can see the tears glistening in their eyes because they knew they were in the music. And then we get in front of the audience and they're nervous and they're frightened and they're, that should not poo-poo the experience coming up. I had to shift my thinking because my old thinking was causing me some problems about pride, right? So I had to shift my thinking. The Israelites, let's think of it this way. When they were first exiting Egypt and stuff and they had the tents, right? Did they get to scent their tents up and just stick there? No. During the day, there was a cloud. And every day or whenever, maybe not every day, but whenever the cloud picked up and moved, they had to. And if it happened at night, they had to do it at night. Follow the cloud. This next passage is really, really interesting to me uh, because of how I have heard it explained before. And as I was thinking about, um, okay, off we go. I'm just going to read it and then I'll go into what I discovered if that's okay. Again, thank you for taking me where I am today and listening to God and not just me uh, because I, yeah, off we go. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Do you see the, and my thoughts, than your thoughts? And do you see the Hebrew word above it? I know it's not that clear, but they don't even look the same, do they? Some of that is the preposition my and your, but not most of it. The Greek translation of the Hebrew, who was closer to the original time it was written and stuff, they use two words that mean thought also, but one thought, my thought, or what God was saying, your thought, that word thoughts was an idea, a concept. While the my thoughts, God thoughts, the word for that was manner of thinking, even the ability to think. That's two very different things. Me having an idea and a thought that I sit on is very different than the ability to think or to have the overarching concept, the overarching concept. For instance, in the 70s, raising children, if your child was disobedient, you got the belt, you got the twitch, maybe you had them get the the switch themselves. In the 90s, we started becoming very compassionate, maybe even permissive, right? Right? And many of us older people are like, oh, yeah, we lost that one. Whoops. We better get that back. How do we get spanking back in to, right? Uh, And yet, why is it one or the other? Could we have the compassionate view of the 90s with a firm consequence that might not include hitting, uh, (laughs) that might not include hitting and combine them? 
the thought of the 70s was one thing that shifted to the thought of the 90s, which is one thing. And there's some starting to shift back. Why shift? My thoughts aren't near as good as God's thoughts. God has his totality of a picture. You see, the discipline is for the future of what's going to be happening for the child. And so if you're reacting in the moment because you're frustrated, then you're not actually training the child. You're just venting out your... Here's God's thought, right? Versus my thought. You did the wrong thing. Okay? So I am called to step into God's higher thought. Into God's higher thought. Mm. How are they fit different? It's not an idea settled on. It's not a tent sitting in the desert. That's not God's thought. God's thought picks up. God's thought moves on to the very next thing that's needed and is going to benefit uh, his people. For the rain and the snow come down from heaven. Verse 10, if you're following in the scriptures. For the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it produce and sprout and providing seed of the sower and the bread and the eater. So will my words be which go from my mouth. They won't return empty without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding for which I sent it. What happens when God's word goes out? What happens? It succeeds. If you're looking at those questions, what happens when God's word goes out? It succeeds. How quickly? In my upbringing, how quickly was? Immediately. God says and it goes. Did you read the passage? The passage says, rain and snow melts down, waters the earth. That makes it produce. We know the process of things getting produced and how long that takes. And then it sprouts. Then there's a seed. Then somebody gathers a seed. And then they make a bread. And then they go and they sell it. And then somebody gets to eat it. So God said, I want you to be able to eat and be nourished. And over the course of... Am I making some sense? Why, God? Why can't it just happen quicker? Wait a minute. What are we feasting on from the beginning of the passage? God's speaking. Remember that thing that satisfies? Remember that thing that satisfies that cost a listening ear? That's all it costs with an intent to obey that we seek in the current moment. And when we start to have memories that pull us out of the current moment, we use those memories in a manner that drives us back to seeking God right now so that we can hear, so that we're satisfied, not by the trivial stuff around us and once I start worrying about the future and what might be coming I start to get a bit parched which means oh I need to use my ability to think about tomorrow and next week and the bills that are coming in a manner where I'm showing I'm listening and I'm ready to obey I need to turn from my unrighteous and my wickedness to put my ears on to God so that his word can take place in me How quickly, painstakingly, day after day, month after month, welcome to the Christian life. It's not an easy one. It's just a blessed one. It's not a comfortable one. It's just an absolutely satisfying one. In fact, the only thing that can satisfy, the only thing that can truly satisfy. For you will go out with joy, be led forth with peace, Wait a minute. Out of God's mouth comes the word that becomes, right? Through the process of the rain. Out of God's mouth, wait a minute, what goes forth? Some of you aren't, oh, sometimes when you're looking down, I'm thinking you're looking at, at the scripture and you just found me in verse 12. What goes forth? Verse 12. That's verse 11. My word will be, which goes out of my mouth. Verse 12, what goes forth? We do. Thank you. We go out, and we go out with joy. You remember the, pe- the message of the peace, the gospel of peace on our feet. We go out with joy, led in peace, and all of creation starts to rejoice. Why? Because we, who are the listeners to God, seeking God, living out what we hear, we're coming, and people rejoice. And as a matter of fact, so much that... They recognize, 
hey, when this person of God comes around, the thorns in my life, the thorns in my life become like juniper, an aromatic plant that has healing properties, that reduces inflammation. Juniper, like, you know, it was not just a beautiful bush and a nice tea. It was a curative, still is. Science has shown some of the curatives of juniper. So wait a minute. When I become this person who seeks God in my present moment, I become the kind of person that people are rejoicing that I'm around because they know that the thorns in their life become a blessing. And the thistles and the stings become myrtle. Myrtle was a salve, an antibacterial. Myrtle cured wounds. Wait a minute. So me, the follower of God, the follower of God is one who helps other people's wounds be cured. That's right. That's right. Because I'm living out the word of God which will be accomplished not in a moment, but through the drenching of the rain and the growing of the seed in the month after month and the year after year and the week after week. God's word going out. What does it look like? That's the last question on there. What does it look like? It looks like you. God's word going forth, what does it look like? It looks like you. It looks like me. It looks like us. It looks like us sharing the gospel of peace and bringing hope to the people around us. Just like this gym, right? We've had some people who had a whisper that this is cold in February for those kids. And when they heard that whisper, they said, let's do something about it. And if you go out and look at that, it's covered. It's enclosed. The kids are much safer, more comfortable. Could that be the word of God? Did it take time and effort? Yeah. Think of the Tuesday meals of hope. Think of a man in our church who every Tuesday brings the kids donuts. Some people think the kids are excited about the donuts, but they don't say, the donuts are here. They say, Yogi is here. Joy in their hearts. Anyway, uh, hopefully you've heard a little whisper uh, in your own heart about that encouragement to seek God consistently and to just stay filled up, stay filled up um, so that we can be that word going forth. God, I want to thank you. Uh, I feel like I'm wrapping up insufficiently. And uh, right in that moment, I remember myself sitting down at the piano knowing that that was insufficient teaching. But it's not my sufficiency, it's not my brilliance, it's not my ability to part, uh, set the word out. It is your ability to speak to our hearts and our desire to listen. And so I thank you for speaking to me today, to us today, and uh, the encouragement that, can, that that can be tomorrow and Monday and Tuesday to keep seeking, to keep drinking, keep eating, to pay the cost, to buy, to buy that which is going to satisfy us with our listening ear. Hallelujah and amen.